Welcome. It is a joy to see each and every one of your smiling faces, especially Rogers. Um, whether you are online or um, you are with us in person, we hope you will enjoy being part of our family here today and enjoy the service. Would you please stand now for the entry of the line? is on higher ground, verses 1 and 2. It is in your boat. Thy kingdom come, 
thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Uh, today you will notice, as always, there are baskets on your tables. This is a good time to remember that that's our love gift to our church, and your tithes and offerings are welcome. Uh, please place them there, and now enjoy the special music that's brought to us by the Pale Team. to us today is from Philippians 3, 17 through 4, 1. This happens to be the NIV. Join together in following my example, brothers and sisters, and just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. For as I have often told you before and now tell you again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things, but our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await the Savior from there, the Lord 
Jesus Christ, who, by the power that enables him to bring everything under his control, will transform our lowly bodies so that they will be like his glorious body. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love and long for, my joy and crown, stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. All of you were facing this way. We didn't see who snuck in the back door of the sanctuary as we were having our opening home. There sits Darth Roby and Greg sitting back there. So, and then the other, so yeah, you can applaud to see you. And sitting at a table by himself back there, you need to be there. There's a mystery in our midst today. And Randy, we welcome you. And we're glad you're here with us today. So before you leave here, make sure you contact them and say, I love you, and there's nothing you can do about it. How, what are you bananas about? You ever said that statement? That's what I wrote about today. You know, I don't think I'll be making a controversial statement this morning when I say that many sports fans are crazy. Of course, I'm not talking about any sports fans here this morning, right? I'm talking about the other team's fans. They're nuts. I was watching, and I'm sure you were last evening, as we had a barn burner again. And I was watching the painted faces that some of the band members had and of uh, the other team. And uh, we, that was just really wild. The things, and I was thinking about it. But it doesn't matter if you're cheering for a preschool t-ball game or if you're cheering for March Madness, as many of us were last evening across the nation. But sports fans are just absolutely crazy. They paint their face, their bodies, the team colors. Some of them even dress up like sharks. Uh, you know, they, they spend hours in stadiums, no matter how cold it is or if it's raining. And, you know, they were just absolutely would be there when the teams played. And one of the greatest salvations was they started making dome stadiums so they didn't have to bear it through the weather. But I keep thinking of those people in Green Bay. When our son was with the Atlanta Falcons and he had to be handle all of the travel for the Falcons and he had to be in Green Bay, he said, I have never been in a place on a football field as cold as I was in Green Bay. He said, even though they have insulated, you know, heated turf now, he said, it's still cold. But fans are crazy. They wear that piece of cheese on their heads, you know, and so we have all of that. But I'm sure that there are many extremists in the bottom of it, so they yell their heads off, they cheer for their team. There's something about loyalty for a sports team that makes people just absolutely do crazy things. I read an article about a high school wrestle team coach that is girls and boys won the state championship. And it's at Washburn Rural High School in Topeka, Kansas. And his slogan was, and I'm sure it's got what he got was, go for the whole banana. Well, some fan started sending him bananas. <laughs> and he kept getting, he wound up in his office with more than 600 bananas in his office. So he said, I have to give them away and put them out and do it. He said, I did a lot of things with it. But his winning slogan was, he said, win the whole banana. And I'm sure that's where the fan picked up on it. It says, well, if you like bananas, let me tell you what we're going to do. So he sent him 600 bananas. But win the whole banana is an interesting rally cry, I think, when you think about it today. Well, uh, you know, it's sort of like this fact being is sports fans are nuts. Should be done with it. I'm one of those nuts. I have to be careful. I, I turn the sound off. Uh, I'm sorry. But I can't 
watch the game and listen to the bubbleheads talking about all this and that. My thinking, my thoughts is, if you're that smart, why aren't you a coach? Why aren't you there coaching the team doing what it's supposed to be done? Uh, if, you're, if you're that way, then don't criticize that player. He's out there playing, but we get that. So I turn my sound off. I just watch the game and, and enjoy it that way. And so that's what I do. Because, but I have to be careful because God is my witness. He's had to make me bite my tongue a few times because I get to questioning the referees, the officials. I don't like all the reviews. Do you like all of them? They've got to look them over again. And then we had a game, the other, you know, one of the games we had, they reviewed the, the play for five minutes. That takes all the spirit out of, out of the team. But anyway, that's where it is. But in our scriptures today, as you heard Sue read them, the Apostle Paul is trying to rally those Philippian Christians. And when he tells them, you know, stand firm. All right? Stand firm in your faith. No matter what, if you read yesterday's article in the Arkansas Democrat of the religion page, or you found out what's going on in the Methodist Church, well, stand firm. You know, God is in control of all this. God's going to find us out. God's going to be in control of that. So that's what I wrote about this morning, because God is good. And if you ever go to Emmaus, they will tell you God is good all the time. And the answer will come back to you all the time. God is good. And that's what it's about. And I got a beautiful text this morning with the music being played about It's Good by Riley Clemens, and I enjoyed it. As a matter of fact, it's an earworm going off right now in my head, and I have to be careful to move it out. But I'm thinking about good. Standing firm in our faith in spite of the persecution that comes from society. I'm reading religiously about times, and that means I read a lot, okay? That means I'm being Christian religion, but I'm being religious in my reading of what's really transpiring around the world for the Christian church. It's not good. And in spite of it, as well as the inner conflict that we have in our own denomination, uh, we have false teachers in the church. They had it, Paul was having that issue there in Philippi, and he was having to deal with it. He was trying to tell them, look what you do, stand firm in your faith. And there are plenty of challenges that could destroy a new congregation like he had started in Philippi. There were a lot of things. And it's also the same thing happens today in today's churches. We were, somebody asked me about a particular church this morning. Guess what? It's closed. It's not there. You know, the building's up for sale. Now, those kind of things are occurring. But Paul needed to give those Philippians a rally crop. He had to really push them. He had to motivate them. He had to be a Zig Ziglar. Or he had to give motivation times that I used to remember being in sessions with Zig Ziglar when he was trying to get the sales force that when I was in the sales world motivating us, getting us going. But Zig would tell you all of his motivations came from the Bible. And a matter of fact, by the time he got through being a big public speaker, he started his own Bible Sunday school in First Baptist Church in Dallas. And he was televised. That's how big it was. Anyway, so we can see what you can get motivated to stand firm in your faith. And Paul needed that rally cry. And he, if you li listen to what Sue was reading, he gives us some tools in that text that really and truly empowered them in Philippi and their faith in Jesus Christ and in us today, even with the issues that are going on around us. And so when you heard Sue read the, well, I keep thinking about what she was reading, but as she was reading, I kept saying, when the whole banana as she was reading. Is that, I think Paul would have liked that rally cry. But as you read the rally cry that was chosen from Philippians 4.1, and it's there in your bulletin for you to read. Therefore, my brothers and sisters, he's talking about everybody. You whom I love and long for, stand firm in the Lord in this way, your friends. You see, he's, he wants to motivate them to stand strong. And we've got to do the same thing today in our world. Stand firm in the Lord. That's his rally cry. That's what Paul was rally crying. And that's his challenge to that Philippian church uh, 2,000 years ago. It, it's his challenge to us here in Mabelville this morning in all the churches across America. Stand firm in the Lord. It's not a bad motto, really. 
I had a pleasure of meeting a tremendous minister. Y'all probably heard him talk about him. John and I had dinner with him. He's the Wally Cox looking fellow. But when he stands up to preach, you don't see him as Wally Cox. You see him as a messenger of God's <laughs> word. Named Fred Credit. He was a professor of preaching at Emory. And then he developed Tret syndrome and had to give up that. But while he was there, he left and went to Cherry Law, Georgia, which is up in the mountains, and started the church. And it did well until he passed away. He did a marvelous job. But one of the great things, he was a tremendous storyteller. And Dr. Craddock tells of being invited to go out to a rural church, at a little church out in the country, uh, many years ago. And when he walked into the door of the church, he saw the strangest thing hanging behind the pulpit. Instead of a cross or other religious Im imagery, there was a picture of an English bulldog. <laughs> and beneath the bulldog's jolly face was the caption, get a bulldog grip on your face. <laughs> and it, and it, it was that, he so he said the pastor obviously was a sports nut. So that's what he did. But Paul might not agree with the idea of hanging a picture of a dog behind the pulpit, but he would certainly agree with the sentiment that's there. Get a bulldog grip on your feet. And I kept thinking of, you know how they all said if a turtle bites you, it won't turn loose until it thunders. And I thought, whoa, we get, how, how long that bulldog would hold on, you know? <laughs> but that's what our faith has got to be. We've got to stand firm in it, and we've got to have that bulldog grip upon our faith. It was relevant, it would have been relevant to the Philippians if Paul had used that, but it's the same. It's still relevant to us today. And so as you listen to what Sue was reading to you, there's several tools for you and me as Christians to use in making our abilities to stand firm in the faith. And that's where we are today. We're there. there one of the tools is this. And it's what you're doing right at this moment. Did you know that? One of the tools that he said, if you go back and read that scripture that's there in the bullet print in your bulletin, you will see get, it says, get connected with other believers. What are you doing this morning? You're getting connected, right? And if you, you connect with others, then you find strength and you find support in a community of people and who are striving to live an authentic Jews, as, as authentic Jesus followers. That's why we're here. We're trying to be authentic in our faith. We want to stand firm. And so Paul wrote, as you heard read there in Philippians 3.17, join together. That's what he meant. That means come together in, form, in following my example, brothers and sisters, just as you have us as a model, keep your eyes on those who live as we do. In other words, look at it, find out it. How many of us, sort of like years ago when I was dealing with Billy Cannon after he won the Heisman Trophy down at LSU, and one of the things Billy said, I hope I never do something wrong that some young boy who idolizes me sees me doing. In other words, they were emulating him. They wanted to find out what he looked like. They, they did what he did. And that was one of the things we look at. In other words, while we come to church and we visit together, we get to know model Christians. We get to see them. We get and, and live as they live. That's important for us. And then be a model follower of Christ ourselves. That's what we are here to do is stand firm and follow Christ. Act like him. Do the things he do. He does. And another thing that Paul gives us advice on is that if you look at there in the 20th verse, he says, remember, guess what? As I read that, I got to really thinking about that. Yes, I live in Little Rock, Arkansas. And Arkansas is in the center of the United States. But that is not what's important to me and to you as well. He says there, our citizenship is in heaven. That's where it is. It's not here. Like we're here as a citizen of this. But think about what our citizenship is. It's in heaven. And there, if you look in the 
18th and 19th verse there, the, listen to what it says again. For as I have told, often told you before, and now tell you again, how many times do you ever have to repeat something? <laughs> how many times do you have to do something for it to become a habit? I remember going through course school and you had to check all the meds you were giving to a patient three times. You checked him when he wrote it down, you checked it when you walked in front of the patient, and you checked it to find the patient's name. You did it three times because you wanted it to become a habit that you don't give them the wrong thing. And that's what he's saying to you and me here. This is, as I told you before, I tell you now again. But I'm telling you now with tears in his eyes. That's emotional for Paul. Because if you and I think about Paul, and I don't, I can't, I have trouble seeing Paul cry. And then, but that's my issue, not yours. And then he goes on to say, their destiny is destruction. Their God is their stomach. And, and I got, well, it really got to me when he said that, my God was my stomach. But he says, their glory is in their shame. Their mind is set on earthly things. And that's, what he was trying to say to them and say to you and me today, there's more. Our citizenship, yeah, we're, we're citizens of here, but our citizenship really is in heaven. And what do we do to get there? And that's important for us to be there in all of that. And so we think of it at times. There was a famous French philosopher that reminds us, and I have written this down, and it's so I can see it quite often says we are not physical beings having a spiritual experience. We are spiritual beings having a physical experience. In other words, our citizenship is not here, it's there in heaven. We think of it. And to be a spiritual being means to me, and I pray it does to you, to live in tune with God's heart and God's mind. That's important for us. That's how we're to live. And as we travel on through Lent and moving ourselves closer to Easter and what all the wonderful expressions that are being said and all the wonderful things that are be happening in our lives as we continue through Lent, and what would it be like, what would living look like if we lived like we were literally citizens of heaven? What would it look like? Think about it. Go back and read in Galatians 5. Here's what Paul said it would look like. It would be the fruit of the Spirit. We would have love. We would have joy. We would have peace. We would have patience. Boy, that one really, I need that. We'd have kindness, goodness, faithfulness. You hear this morning, because of our faithfulness, that's why we're here. It would have been easy for me after I hit the send button for that article this morning, at for something this morning, to have rolled back in bed and said, pull the covers over and says, Lord, I'm just not going to go today. It would have been easy, but he said, be faithful. And then there's gentleness. Can you imagine how gentle Jesus was? Except when he was tearing out the temple and throwing all the money changers out. And then it's self-control that we have. And that comes from that inward spirit that we have. And so would look a lot like Jesus if we had all of that. And remembering our citizenship in heaven, realize that when we remember that, it allows you and me to rise from the misery that we've been around. It allows us to get out of the COVID world. It allows us to not go through this valley of the virus. It allows us to say, okay, there's great things on the other end of this valley. And so that's where we are. It gives us, get rid of the present circumstances. And it gives us the hope in our lives that we need to stand firm. I remember one of the things that happened when I was going through school. I had a principal for many years, Shelley Marshall Bailey. He had other names, but that's all I'm gonna give you because it was about this long. <laughs> I remember talking and his son was a year ahead of me in school, Shelley was there. We were talking one day about what we could depend on things with our parents. And Shelley said, one thing I can always depend on is where my dad stood as principal 
but as his father, and he would say, do the right thing. And that's where we are today. Do the right thing in our life. And so, when we're tempted to give up. And another tool that Paul reminds us is that we can stand firm in the Lord because we eagerly await our Savior. We all think, you know, I can ask you right now, are you ready for the Lord to come? You said, I'm not really quite sure yet, but I, I'm hoping I'm around when he does. We see, we don't, we don't, but he wants us to remember, to eagerly wait. And that's what you're doing here on Sunday morning, is preparing yourself, waiting to be able to wait for the Savior, for the Lord Jesus Christ. That's why we're moving toward Easter. That's what Easter is all about. But our citizenship is in heaven. And we eagerly await our Savior from there. So that's the ultimate source of our hope. That's it. And for us to be able to be ultimately motivated to stand firm in the Lord. And as you look and read further in that scripture, he promised to come back. But not as a humble human being. But as the Messiah, that's what he's coming back at. And we will see him as he truly is. And that's the marvel of it all. And that truth transforms our waiting into a time of purposefulness. We're there. It brings out joyfulness in us. It, it gives us a hopeful living life. Because Jesus promises to reward those who follow his command until he returns. That means we've got to continue to do it. So, when you think on it, there in verse 4-1, Therefore, my brothers and sisters, you whom I love, listen to that, I love and long for my joy and crown. You realize, that's what we are to Christ. Stand firm in the Lord in this way, dear friends. When you realize Think about that. Remember that the Apostle Paul most likely wrote these words that you heard read this morning from prison with chains hooked to it. I can see him walking back and forth and dictating his letters to someone, scribing it for him. And his advice written more than 2,000 years ago is just as relevant for us today as it was then. It's important for us. And God has given us the tools for you and me to stand firm in the Lord. It's important for us to be that strong. No matter what our circumstances are, God has given us that. He connects with the community of believers. He's connected with us right now. His spirit is in the midst of all of this today. And remember that our citizenship is in heaven. That's what we must keep before us. And eagerly awaiting the coming of Jesus Christ. That's why we celebrate Lent. That's why we move through these 40 days, excluding Sundays, to get ourselves from Ash Wednesday to Easter and prepare ourselves for that great getting up morning. God is faithful to his promise. And he will supply the strength that you and I need until he comes. And we get to see him face to face. That's his advice to us. Stand firm in the faith. That's our motto. If you like to get a bulldog grip on it better, then <laughs> use that as well. And so on this day, what are you coping hands about? In his holy name we pray. sending us forth is Jesus is calling on the Lord. Please stand if you're able.
Joyce for filling in, because Carmen right now is in Guatemala. And we pray that you can stay safe there and come back with us. She'll be gone for another Sunday, but keep her in your thoughts and in your prayers. And thank you, Joyce, for filling in so good. For you see the benediction, that may the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you in your going out and in your coming in. And may he be what you go absolutely bananas about. In his holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen.